All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Uh, this is September the 16th, 2018, and our guest today is Ellen Datlow. Hey, Ellen. Hi, nice to see you again. You too. Uh, we're going to talk about best of the best. Which I have to here if I can pry it out from under my cat's body. Yeah. <laughs> I just got my own copy. I don't even know if you can see it. Well, there you go. Yeah, I've been yeah. trying to get a picture and I of it. Of it. And like, it. What it has is like it has the old co- the cover for all the uh, earlier one, you know, the first 10. Not one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, 10 of them. Nice. Or nine of them? <laughs> no, 10. Okay. All right. Yeah, it has all the cover. But you can't see. When I tried to take pictures, it, it kind of doesn't show. So it's a <laughs> light. What can I say? But yeah, it's really big. It's like. Uh, yeah, it's the 75. Well, the story is the 465 pages. And well, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Let's do introductions real quick. Um, Heather, why don't we start with you? Sorry, desperately trying to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. I'm Heather Landry. Hi, Ellen. Um, I'm an artist, a horror artist, and you can find my stuff at sampaperdaisy.com. What's your last name? Sorry. Oh, uh, Landry. L A N D R Y. Everybody always thinks it's laundry. <laughs> okay. Heather's Heather's an artist. She's done some work for Lovecraft Easing Press. She's mm-hmm. very good. Mm-hmm. So, okay, Rick. Rick Lay, writer. Uh, Philip Fracassi. Yeah, Philip Fracassi, uh, author and screenwriter. That's Hi, enough. Philip. Hey, what, on. Do have, what do you have? What the hell do you have on that shirt? I have my I'm my Strange Eons shirt today. Are you, are you representing Kelly because he's not here? I am. I'm representing Kelly because he's not here. I don't have any whiskey with me, uh, which would be really, truly representing Kelly's presence, but I figured I'd throw the T-shirt on at least. Yeah, you, you are a good friend. Well, okay, Matthew. To be decided. Yeah. Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. Um, the latest book I did with Ulthar Press is called Pickman's Gallery, and it's available on Amazon and Kindle. Hi. Uh, all right, and Benjamin. Hi, I'm Ben Handelman. Uh, I guess I also have to stand in for Kelly since he's not here when we <laughs> discuss some things later. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll do that. Uh, but first we'll talk to Ellen. So, uh, Ellen, I really can't imagine that anyone listening to this or watching this does not know who you are, but for maybe that one. Well, let's turn it by accident, you know, or one of, or maybe someone's going to harass me from Twitter since I've been I tweet for uh, provocative things occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can you give us uh, just a brief summary of your uh, of yourself? What do you do? Yeah, well, I'm an editor. I'm a short story editor. I've been editing short fiction since 1980 or so. I worked at Omni Magazine and on the internet, and then we started Event Horizon, and then I was working at. Um, sci-fi.com for six years and I've been acquiring freelance I've been acquiring short stories and novellas for tour.com tour to first for the website and now sometimes for their they have a tour.com novella series which is a book series so I've acquired some novellas for that and I've been doing it and I edit anthologies of science fiction fantasy and horror reprint and originals and theme and not themed and I run KGB, I co-run KGB, the uh, Fantastic Fiction Reading Series in the East Village, New York. What's that? It's a reading series, a monthly reading series that Terry Bisson and um, uh, Alice Turner started in, I'm not sure, late 90s, I think. Okay. And um, then Alice left Playboy and she stopped doing it. It, initially, it was like main a mainstream writer and a fantasy, a speculative fiction writer. And... Um, and then Terry asked me to help him out, and we did it together for a few years until he moved to the West Coast. And then I took on uh, Gavin Grant, did it with me for a few years until he moved from New York to Massachusetts. And Matt Kressel's now been doing it with me for at least 10 years, I think. And we basically try to have one relatively bigger name and a, and a new person, newer person uh, reading at the it, KGB bar is this old socialist bar. Um, that was written well it was it, i mean it's not a socialist bar but it was originally a socialist it was a center for uh ukrainians actually you know what i don't know if we, uh, i don't want to get it wrong because it was either the ukrainians or the russians and they hated each other so uh but so i'm not sure which it was but 
it was a it was a social club where they hung out, and then there was another social club blocks away that was the other faction, and they all hated each other. But anyway, it's now a bar, but it has a lot of the Soviet paraphernalia around it, so it's great. It's not great for it's really bad for um, uh, people who can't walk upstairs. It's actually a fire trap, but you know that's the way. Hey, it's grandfathered in. What can I say? Um, and it's up, it's up a steep flight of stairs. But we've been doing it for like at least you know I've been doing it for a really long time, and it's fun. You know, it's it's the third Wednesday of every month, and this month next week we have um, we have two people, and who do we have? Uh, Patrick McGraw and Siobhan Carroll are reading. Are both reading together? Sounds so, great. Yeah, so we do that monthly. Um, well, we are going to talk about Vista the Best in a few minutes, but um, uh, novellas coming up for tour. That, that you've uh, acquired for tour. Do you want to talk about some of them that have, sure. that are, well, have just I mean, come I, out or about to come out? Yeah. Well, the first one I acquired for the book series, I mean, I had acquired a, a few for the, when tour.com initially was doing the novellas online with their short stories. And then they decided, then they stopped doing the novellas online and then they were just books and eBooks. And the first one I acquired in the series was the Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Laval. And the second um, came out, uh, I had, that was three years ago, two years ago, Twilight, The Twilight Pariah and uh, Mapping the Interior by Jeff Ford and by Stephen Graham Jones came out. This year, Kelly Robeson's uh, science fiction time travel novella is called, um, oh my God, uh, Glides, Monsters and the Lucky Peach. And I've acquired two that are coming out next year, one by um, C.S.E. Cooney which is called Desdemona and the Desdemona and the Deep and it's fantasy. And I've acquired um, Priya Sharma's Orm Shadow, which is a barely fantasy, deeply troubled fam familial story. <laughs> That's barely fantasy, but it's really terrific. And so those are the ones that are coming out this coming next year that I've just acquired that I'm in the middle of editing actually. So. I really enjoyed uh, The Twilight Pariah. Yeah, yeah, no, Jeff does a great job. Oh, I just finished Ahab's Return. I really liked it. Yeah. His novel. His novel. Um, I just finished it yesterday, and it's terrific. I yeah. mean, it's got, it speculates that Ahab wasn't actually killed by Moby Dick, and that he returns, um, I forget how, eight years later or something, to New York looking for his family. Yeah. And, um, it's really good. I found it very enjoyable. Yeah. Well, and I can't wait to read it. We had, we had him on the show a few weeks ago. Oh, okay. So he talked about it. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so for all those novella fans out there and fans of uh, Ellen Datlow, can they just go to tour.com and find a list of novellas there? What's the best way to do that? Well, the novellas are, on, are not online. I mean, the novellas are books. No, I mean to, to purchase, I mean. Oh, um, you probably go to Amazon. I mean, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, you can buy them online. I mean, they're print books too. Yeah. Um, you could, you know what? I, I assume that there must be a page on tour. What about a list of the ones that you're talking about? I'm sorry. Or where would we find a list of the That's ones? What I'm trying to figure out. Um, I don't know. I'm assuming on tour.com they have a whole section probably of the novellas and tell you what's coming out and what's been out. Yeah. Maybe you can check. So on quick, tour, if someone, I don't know if I want to go there now. I'm afraid I'll screw up the uh, Matt's Matt's going to check for us. Don't yeah, worry. Go to, uh, look for the novellas. Uh, for, I guess you can start by looking for any, pick any of the titles that have been published already and see if there's a page for them or something that on tour, because at each pay each, Novella should have its own page. I would think on tour books, maybe, which would it come? So. All right. Well, hit me back with that, Matt, if <laughs> and when you find that. So, yeah. Um, okay, Ellen, you were on earlier in the year talking about Devil in the Deep. Mm -hmm. uh, can you recap that for us? That's right. Um, see horror anthology, um, mostly horror, some dark fantasy, and um, it's Mostly, it was it's all originals, um, all new stories about sea or the ocean or the shore. Um, I have one story that takes place in an in ah, don't you dare, don't you dare. He took a who's gonna take a bite. <laughs> I think um, almost everyone in this panel ha has cats, almost. Yeah, but then you understand when I say don't you dare, right? You're not gonna <laughs> do it. <laughs> um, 
Uh, one story by Brad Denton is kind of an inland sea story. I mean, I told people that you can, if you have an inland sea, you can do that too. So it's actually a boat. It's about a ship that flies on, on the inland sea. It's not about that, but there is a ship that flies in the inland sea. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And so uh, it's, I really am happy with that anthology. You know, it has a lot of different voices and different types of stories. And I thought it was, um, I'm really happy with how it came out. Yeah. And even it has a couple of amusing stories, darkly amusing, but still amusing, which is unusual for me. Because yeah. I usually don't find horror, humorous horror very effective. Uh, yeah, I don't either. Um, Did you, read, you get a chance to read it, the book? I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but only but I, I really want to, especially because I, I love sea stories and ocean stories. Mm -hmm. But you know how it is. My TBR pile is like. Well, I know. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it is on the pile. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, mm -hmm. Before I get to best of the best guys uh, and gal, uh, do we? Do you guys have any questions? Do you want to jump in for a minute at all, or you want me to proceed to best of the best? Can I ask a stupid newbie question? Sure. Okay, and I am sorry. But yeah, I was just wondering, whenever you put together those awesome uh, collections of uh, new fiction, which I don't know, I was really enjoying Blackthorn, White Rose last night, and that was amazing, and I didn't know if that was one of those or not. But oh, yeah, it, well, it's one, of, it's one of six adult fairy tale anthologies that Terry and I worked on. Oh, so good. But, um... I was wondering, do you get to actually approach authors you really like and ask them to make craft something for it, or do you go through your huge pile of awesome submissions? What do you? No, do? actually, I go mostly. I I don't have a slush pile anymore. I mean, it's rare that I do an anthology with a slush pile, um, unless a co-editor or someone insists and they volunteer to read most of it. Um, mm -hmm. So no, that's what I do. I solicit stories from people from the writers who I like whose work I really love. And hopefully sometimes they'll say yes and sometimes they'll say no. It depends on how much time they have. Oh, so that's what cool. exactly what I do. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And some of the people, I mean some of the I mean I once in a while there's a story in the, that fairy tale series. Um I didn't realize that I I Terry and I published a story by Patricia Briggs years and years, years ago in one of those anthologies. And I didn't realize she was the one who became well known. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Patty Briggs does urban fantasy and is a really hot author now. Um, but at the time, I don't even know if she's ever written other stories than that, or many others, maybe one or two. She's written another one for me um, in an urban fantasy anthology, Naked City. But, but in between that time, I'm not sure how much short fiction she writes. But I mean, it, I actually don't know how we knew about her. Uh, Terry must have known about her because I don't remember her name. I don't know how it came up, but you know, we each had our own connection. So for every anthology, if I do it with somebody or not, either I use my connections with the people whose work I like, and I try to contact them one way or another, or I get, or my co-editor might know a lot of people and you know, they'll say, Hey, let's ask so-and-so. I said, sure, go ahead. Let's ask them. Neat. So, yeah. Yeah. And you know, and if people, sometimes people might recommend, I mean, I might be reading a lot of what I find is, by reading for, for the best of the year, I'll see who's out there, whether in fantasy, science fiction, or horror, because um, even though I'm looking for horror, I read a lot of, I read so much material for that book, that series that I'll see, I mean, I skim Asimov's, I mean, I actually have someone mostly looking at Asimov's for me, but I look at FNSF, which has science fiction, fantasy, and horror, and I look at, um, you know, other venues that have, that cover all three genres, subgenres of the fantastic. Um, so I, you know, I do notice new writers that way. Not as many science fiction writers as I used to. I mean, I've been starting to buy a few more science fiction pieces for Tor.com just because I wanted to get back into it more. Um, so I'm approaching my, you know, the people who I know have been writing uh, science fiction and people I've worked with in the past and gotten some really good stories. And I get stories from people. Um, I bought a story recently from Tor.com by Carol Johnstone, who I've only known as a horror writer. I mean, I've published her in the year's best a lot. I've published her in a few of my anthologies. And um, she sent me a story for Tor.com, and it's science fiction. It's horror, but it's actually science fiction. And that was kind of like, oh, okay. And Nina Allen I knew as a horror writer in Dark Fantasy, and she sent me a story a couple of years ago, The Art of, I think it's called The Art of Space Travel, which, I, which was pure science fiction not horror at all. And I loved it and I bought it. So it's interesting. 
some of the most interesting writers I find are those who go back and forth within the subgenres and they write a story on whatever and then it turns out, okay, where should I sell this? I mean, Jeff Ford is like that. He'll write, he writes science fiction, he writes fantasy, and he writes horror. I think we lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here she is. No, you're still here. You're fine. Oh, yeah. Who's Uzu? I don't see Uzu. Oh, that, that's me. <laughs> Oh, it's my, yeah. I think anyway. Oh, okay. oh you're Uzu. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even sure what is on that, so I apologize. <laughs> no, no, it's just, it's just your name and a no picture. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, anyone else want to jump in with a question? Before I proceed? yeah. Um, so you mentioned Ballad of Black Tom, which is maybe the greatest Lovecraftian story written in the last um, hundred years, give or take. Really, you think? Wow. Okay. I, I do. I love that um, Victor Lavelle was able to take oh, Lovecraft's worst, most racist story and, and then so. make it. I mean, he completely he made this wonderful novella. The mm -hmm. characters were interesting. The way the racism was handled by each of um, the two detectives and uh, Suleiman. Mm -hmm. um, the way all of it was tied. I mean, you read the story, obviously. You edited it. You know how wonderful it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was curious how um, how you found it or how you how that process started. Was he reached out to or did he submit it? Well, I met him at ReaderCon several years ago, and I liked his novel. I loved Big Machine, um, which was the first thing I read by him. And I guess I probably approached him. I saw him at ReaderCon and introduced myself. I'm, I'm not, I, I have a terrible memory. I think this is what I remember happening, that I ran into him at ReaderCon. He must have had a badge. I must have said, hey, I love your work. Why don't you send me something for tour? Dot com. And a few years later, this novella appeared. And it was actually right when we were doing the transition from novellas online. I had published three novellas, a few novellas online, Waters of Versailles, um, The Pope, Pope Prince, uh, and The Eucalyptus Tree. It's not the right title, but Usman, Usman D. T. Malik's novella and Nancy Cress's novella one. And I was, we were starting to do the book novella series. And we were not supposed to be, uh, we were, sometimes we have a blackout. We're not supposed to buy anything for a while. We had two full up in the tour.com. So they don't buy anything for three months or whatever. So I was, I loved the story. I loved the novella. And I went to Irene and said, and I also, I said, okay, I don't know if you want to use it for the new novella line or could we put it, we would buy it off for the online. And I don't know which would be better for Victor. And we said, well, we don't have, we're not going to buy it for online right now because we don't, um, there's no room. I mean, we just don't, we don't want to, we don't have a slot for it right now. But, you know, we'll make an offer for the, for the ebook, you know, for the book as an ebook and a print book in the tour.com novella line. So we approached him that way and that's what he said, okay, sure. And so that's what happened there. That it was, it came in because, I mean, I asked for something. This is what happens a lot. I'm, I'll ask people whose work I like. I'll, I'll say I want to, you know, send me something, and then, you know, five years later, I get something. It's like, oh, wow, so and so sent me a story. <laughs> so that's it panned out. That's how that happened. And we're hoping to get his. He's supposed to be doing a sequel, and we're hoping to get it. Would very much like to publish it. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, at um, at my local community college, I was recently taking classes, and I actually got the English teacher to read his novella. And she loved it so much. She's talking to the school about introducing it into the curriculum next year. Oh, time. fabulous! Yeah, I think it's being made into a movie. I think. Yes, I, I believe it's that's more than right. option. I think it's beyond uh, option. Uh, wait, a TV series? I think. I know Lovecraft Country is by Matt Ruff, but I think also Ballad of Black Tom. Something's going on with it. Yeah, the I only one I had heard about was the uh, Lovecraft Country is going to be a little mini series. I think. Right. I could have sworn something with Ballad of Black Tom too, but I'm not sure. I, I uh, really, I do think. I really think that's accurate, although my memory is failing me right now as to mm -hmm. which one. Uh, and the PMs I'm getting from you guys seem to indicate that the Tor.com website does not have set a page listing the novellas. Okay. Well, I mean, I know there's some place because I've seen the forthcoming. Everyone, I, it may be on the blog. Has someone did a search on Tor.com, the website, looking for those things? Anything? Yeah. Yeah. You have these nothing. And what comes up? Nothing. Although I suppose Googling Tor tour novellas might come up with something yeah. who knows yeah. no no it doesn't it, it oh, really? refers you back and you can do a, a search on tour of all novella related posts but it's not a convenient list and uh in the 10 or so links i tried to look just searching generally in google they were not 
Wait a minute. Yeah, here, I just found something at the top. Right here it is. Tour.com novellas and it's tagged and it's got a whole but it's got a whole page full of forthcoming. Maybe not. Yeah, here they all are. They're here. Okay. They're on um, tour.com slash tag. I mean, I just Googled it, tour.com novellas, and it came up. Um, it's tour.com tag slash tag slash tour dash com dash novellas. Yeah, this, this has all the related posts. Right, but it talks about all of them coming up. They're all announced. And when and if you go on each one, you'll see when they're coming out. Okay. And it's starting, it's from February 1st, 2017. Actually, earlier than an earlier page. Sure, so just, yeah, so yes, it's all there. And then the first thing is tour.com. Yeah, and it mentions Ballad of Black Tom. So yeah, I mean it's all the tag. Yet yeah, that's why if you look for the tags, it tells you all the novellas that are coming out and when they're coming out. Uh, um, anyway, Philip, you have a question, comment? I uh, no, I was just gonna say that I, I saw that uh, the Victor Laval novella is gonna be an AMC series, TV series. Oh, okay. uh, Ballad of Black Tom will be an AMC. AMC is currently developing the series, so it's, oh, it's, in, it's in development. Yeah. I mean, I loved his also. I loved his uh, uh, um, The Devil in Silver and also The Changeling. I Changeling think. was great. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's an amazing That's writer. Great. He's an option, too, if not beyond, you know, yeah, he's a very, very good writer. I'd be surprised if anything he wrote was not option at this point, given how popular right. Changeling was. It was really went, went took off. Mm -hmm. Devil and Silver, I thought, was also um, excellent. I mean, it's not it's not Lovecraftian, but it's a very um, it's got horror element. And it's terrific. Yeah, right. Well, exactly. Changeling, Changeling isn't Lovecraftian either. I mean, it's yeah. weak, but I don't think and horror, but I don't think it's Lovecraftian. I don't think of it that way. More more of a fable almost. Yeah. Well, yeah. for Devil those Victor Lavelle uh, fans out there listening, he will be on the show in a few months. We're nailing down a date, but um, you can always. Uh, see who's coming up by going to the Lovecraft Zine website, lovecraftzine.com, uh, mm -hmm. and just click on podcast. It's up at the top left. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, anybody else have a question before I go on to best of the best? I do, but I'll wait till after you discuss the best of the best book. I like your mask, by the way. That is a mask, yeah? Yeah. You like it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. especially. What's it made of? Is it paper? It's wood. No, it's wood. I oh, got it in the one on the shelf. I got it in Guatemala. I thought actually. you were the one he was wearing. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> I'm not wearing a mask, Mike. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I got it in Guatemala. And this one I got um, from. Oh, I can't see the one above. Somewhere else. The one with this skeleton. Oh, it's pretty scary. I won't show it to you. Okay. Well. <laughs> uh, okay, so best of the best. Um, 10 years of essential short horror fiction. Um, you, you talk about that a little bit. Um, that's well, a, for, that's the first of its kind, right? This is my stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, my editor, Jason Katzman, approached me oh, last year and said, hey, we have an idea. Do you want to do a best of the best first 10 years? I said, okay, I guess so. <laughs> sure. Um, and the thing is, I had done um, my book Nightmares for Tachyon, uh, A New Decade of Modern Horror. Some of the stories were I had taken were from my year's best, from my best of the year. So and I so I did not want to duplicate that at all. Um, so in a way that was kind of a almost it was kind of my favorites, my best of the a best of the best kind of thing. But and we did an official I said yes, I will do an official best of the best. And so I went through um, all my stories. I mean, my table of contents, and I chose actually between two and four stories per year, um, juggling which stories to take partly. As I said, I did not want to duplicate anything from Nightmares, um, so I had to avoid anything that had appeared in that. And I, don't remember, I didn't count on how many stories had appeared, but a lot that I liked, a lot. Well, you know, I mean, it's weird because, of course, I loved all the stories because I've taken them for the best of the year. Um, but it was a making a judgment call as to, first of all, which ones I remembered as clearly. I mean, there was one story. I'm not going to say who it was by, and I don't think I ended up taking that one. Um, but I remembered this. I could not remember the story. And I looked it over, and it's like, okay, I, may, I remember the story kind of, but why can't I remember it? You know, it's so weird. <laughs> um, it was very strange. 
So I ended up not taking that particular story by the author. Um, but I tried to get a good ver a variety of the kinds of stories I took. I think there are at least three zombie stories in there. Um, there were some very good zombie stories over the years. And I just tried to get a good mix. And the hardest part, I guess, was kind of putting it together is like what order, because, you know, as you say, it's always the best. You know, they're all the best, so it's not like I'm picking the best story. Um, it's how I do any kind of thing. It's like, okay, how do I choose the first story for anything? It's like it has to be engaging, and I want it to be, to show what the book's about, and, you know, not complicated, just straightforward. You know, this is telling a telling of a plot-oriented story, not with too much weird stuff in it. So that's kind of how I started it. But uh, aside from that, I mean, I had a great time doing it. Um, I didn't have to reread any of the stories. I mean, I, well, some of them I looked at just to make sure I really wanted to use them when I wasn't sure which to pick. But that's how I did it, you know. it was It's a juggling act figuring out, okay, which of these stories do I want to put in this book? And it's not the best of the best, really. It's my favorites. You know, then I, I picked this this week yeah you know, um and that go together in a way that don't clash in the sense that you know there's enough voices i guess and enough types of stories what you said about that first story is so important in in the ways that you stated but also in today's reading world in the days of kindle you know a lot of people will buy that kindle sample and be able to read either the first story or or a lot of the first story. Oh, is there a Kindle sample? I don't even know how it works. But yeah, basically you're on uh, Amazon, let's say, and you're interested in this book, but you're not sure that if you want to buy it or not. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you say, send, send me a sample to my Kindle, and it does. And oh. What it does is, is it gives you a certain percentage of mm -hmm. the first part of the book. Right. So, you know, like with Autumn Cthulhu, like you said, I tried to make it, represent the book mm -hmm. i wanted people to basically if they're reading that kindle sample i wanted them to go oh this is great mm -hmm. uh i'm gonna click the buy button right so, yeah so, yeah yeah so yeah i mean that's always a judgment call to figure out what to put first and last so yeah so um and i tried also to put in stories that maybe weren't reprinted as much but that's always hard by other people i mean you know you, you want you try not to have something that's reprinted a hundred times in the last two years you know so yeah, the further uh, back gaiman's the emerald uh uh study in emerald or uh which i love but yeah yes, I but it's, it's been reprinted a lot. <laughs> no i said i took down to a sunless sea which is short and hasn't been reprinted as much as you would think and yeah. also Brian Hodges, who I love Brian Hodge, and I yeah, love his Brian's story. All of his stuff is great. Yeah, what, what's the name of that story that's been just reprinted everywhere? It's a Lovecraftian uh, story. A lot of his stuff is Lovecraftian now. Yeah, but he's, he's got a story that's just been reprinted. A study in Emerald, your favorite. Everywhere. No, not, we're not talking about no game. No oh, game. No. We're talking about I hope it's not, well, I hope it's not the one I took, The Stagnant Breath of Change. No, that's not it. I, I would recognize it if you said it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I deliberately tried to pick stories that were, haven't been reprinted too much. Yeah. Brian is such a great writer. and, and Yeah, he's gotten stuff. better. I mean, in the last five years, he's been amazing. His short fiction has been amazing. Really pretty good. You know, he's, and I know, I know his, he had a parent die, and maybe both recently, and I think he's been knocked out of his, you know, his. Yes, he title. just, he emailed me actually just a couple of days ago. He's got. He's going to be on the show um, coming up soon, and he said, you know, hey, maybe have a stand-in. I think I'm going to make it, but I'm not sure because I'm dealing with my parents, and, you know, he's going through a lot right now, right. obviously. Yeah. So, and yeah. if that happens, we'll reschedule him because I'd love mm -hmm. to talk to him again on the show. Um, so you didn't have to really reread any that you selected for Best of the Best. Did I hear that no. right? Well, yeah. I mean, what I did is I made a list of the stories. I looked at each volume, my table of contents, and pulled out stories that I remember that I really, really liked, you know, my favorites from each volume. Yeah. And I made a list of, you know, which volume, what date it was published, and what year. 
And um, I did that with all 10 volumes and ended up, of course, with too many stories, you know, and I wanted to make sure I had at least two stories from each volume. And some of the, some of them I, I, you know, I think I wrote down how I think what I figured it out actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, basically, I just took between two and four stories from each volume. And, yeah, but I also, my editor, my in-house editor wanted me to do kind of a summary also, but not as long as the usual one. But so I, had, I picked, I mean, there are several pages of my favorite novels and collections and stuff also over the past 10 years. So, you know, so that's... Uh, is, is that part of your introduction? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's my, yeah, it's my, yes. It's, okay. is it part of it? Yeah. So instead of a year-end summary like you normally do, it's like a decade? Yes, summary. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it, that is included there. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the favorite novels that are in the last 10 years that I've come up to that point. And collections. I don't know if I did I cover. I mean, I've covered anthologies because that's so. I always hate everyone's anthologies, but my own. <laughs> did you tell me once that you're really not fond of writing introductions, or am I thinking? Well, I hate writing it? introductions. I hate <laughs> writing anything. No, I, I covered um, the single author collections, and maybe, and that's really it. Yeah, I only I did. A, I had my favorite collections, my favorite novels, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, I have a book. I have, so I have, I think I have, well, anyway, I have Darkness, which is two of our stories. Is that right? I'm sorry, I just lost you. Yeah, no. say that again, Philip. Darkness, which yeah, is. That was, that was two, two decades of modern horror. And then yeah. Nightmare kind of picks up where Darkness leaves yeah. off, right? Yeah, yeah, between 2005 and 2015. Okay, and then this is, but this, and then this one is. That you said there's no crossover between nightmares no. and. No, and I deliberately made sure there was no crossover whatsoever. Great. Cool. So it's from two thousand, from when I started the year's best number, best horror number one to ten. So it would have been. 17. So I guess um, two thousand seven to two thousand seventeen. I guess mm -hmm. something like, probably. Uh, okay, just FYI for the audience: best of the best, best of the best horror of the year. 10 years of essential horror fiction will be available on October the 2nd. You can pre-order um, now though. Yes, I was going to say it really helps the publisher when you pre-order. Um, Publishers like that. Instead of just waiting until uh, it comes out. I do have a question though, and, and maybe you don't know the answer to this. Maybe this okay. is this is Nightshade, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm looking at the page on Amazon for the best of the best horror. Mm -hmm. And it's available in paperback. It will be in what, there's a problem. Okay, someone yeah. complained on Twitter that some of the best of the years are not available as eBooks right now on Kindle. And I don't know, I told my editor, we don't know what the problem is, we're trying to fix it. Because some of them are, it makes no sense whatsoever. So they all should be available from Amazon on eBook. And I don't remember if they're all audio books. I mean, it depends on whether, um, I can't remember if they exercised their right, right. Um, if they had the rights to audio or if we have to sell audio uh, separately. I don't remember if each volume is audio. But yeah, it should be available as e an ebook also. It will be. Okay, so that, that'll change. And then it's got some kind of, it's a, it's a bit strange. Uh, it says preloaded, instead of audible, it says preloaded digital audio player 54.99. I don't know what I that's about. I have no idea what that even means. <laughs> I didn't even know. Uh, they used to make those. It'd be like a little portable MP3 player that would come with a book. I, I haven't um, seen one that wasn't the Bible in probably 15 years. I wonder if that's even legal. I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's just, it's just, pre it's kind of strange. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe Nightshade can answer that later and, and correct if that if it's I, that. Well, they've got it. I'll ask right. my editor, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> I'll say, I don't know. What is this $55 thing, Nightshade? Yeah, right. Yeah. Because this is a thick book, and it's available uh, in paperback for only ten ninety nine. There's a lot of stories in this book. It's only ten ninety nine. Yeah, that, that seems just very economical to me. For well, actually, yours is seventeen ninety nine, but maybe on Amazon it's cheaper. It's it says ten ninety nine on Amazon. On Darkness, Darkness in paperback is thirty dollars on Amazon. 
Really? That's yeah, weird. It's very so it's expensive. Print? That's ridiculous. So I don't know why it's so expensive. It's still in print as far as I know. This is the new price for 30 bucks. And you, used ones are available for like $3. Yeah, that's not yeah. good. Yeah, um, this copy is very expensive. Yeah, no, um, I have it. It says here it's seventeen ninety nine on the book itself. Yeah, that may be. Uh, I'm assuming it's going to be in stores, so that may be the store price. Well, has, Amazon always has um, discounts. Let's yeah, see. well, I guess my advice to the audience is just in case this does go up, get get your pre order in today at the ten ninety nine for the best of the best war of the year. Yeah, yeah. I did include the link in the uh, show notes. On YouTube, and when I put this on iTunes and other places, I will. Oh, here, see, no, here it is. It is seventeen. It's Amazon because Amazon is seventeen ninety nine, and then they have the cross to off as nine ten ninety nine. Now they do that a lot. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know if it'll go up or not, but certainly I would get it's That's a pre order price. I would certainly get it now when it's cheaper. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the other ones. Let me see what the other ones are. Well, I feel like the best number ten. Is um, ten ninety nine list fifteen ninety nine. Amazon always has them cheaper. Yeah, I don't know. That just seems like a hellaciously great price to me for as thick as this book is, and mm -hmm. for the uh, I'm sure quality of the content. You know, so it's an Ellen Datlow book. That's so right. Going to be great. <laughs> I yeah. say this every time you're on the show. If you, if I know, you're, it's true. It's true. It's all true. It, it, <laughs> it's all true. If you're at the bookstore or if you're on Amazon or if you're at Half Price you Books buy, or wherever they, you're at. Publishers happy. If you buy my books, they'll, they'll buy more books from me. Yeah, if you, if you oh, see God. edited by Ellen Datlow on the cover, just don't even <laughs> read what it's about. Just buy it. Cause it's Did gonna I mention my ghost story anthology last time? Because it has, it's not coming out this year. It's coming out next year. No, I was going to ask you about that next. Uh, Echoes, the saga anthology of ghosts. That's a huge book. That's like 227,000 words or more. I can't remember. It's really long. But I got caught up in a production kind of slowdown. So um, my editor, my in-house editor, said they wanted to hold it till the next till next fall to, so it would get more, it would be able to do more work with it and everything. So I said, fine. You know, so... It's not coming out this year. It's supposed to come out. It's just coming out next fall instead, or August, or whatever. Okay. No. Yeah, and that's all originals with three reprints. I have. Uh, Philip, you look like you might have a comment or question. No, I was just going to say that my, the one book that Ellen did that I've been trying to get a good copy of for that's been out of print is for some reason volume four of the best four of the year is really scarce. Is it? All the other volumes are in print and available on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But four is out of print, and I only the only reason I can think of is because it has a Stephen King story in it. I know, but it's silly, which means they should have kept it in print. I don't That's right. Know. Yeah, I know. it's kind of the it's like you know one of those things I'm always on the lookout for. Um, but speaking of speaking of books that are it's hard, hard to find, have, I might have cop. I probably have a copy of it someplace. Okay, I sold. All right. Well, you know what? If you have an email address, email me. If I have any around the house, I'll see if I can find it and I'll sell it to you for whatever the list price is, you know, whatever the cost of the book is, whatever. Um, yeah, the list price but, is like, what, $110? <laughs> no, no. Nah, nah. But I mean, I may only have them in storage. I, I have so many books I have to put into storage and so I have to see what I've actually got, but I may have a copy of it around. So email me, drop me an email. All right. Email. I will. So, so let's digress a second. Okay. How overwhelmed is your place with extra books sitting around? Oh, it's horrible. It? It's horrible. If I could turn, I don't know if I can turn my computer. Cats and books. Hold on. You can see I'm turning it around a little. Yes. Uh, was that lots of little now, gall I'm heads? Around. Okay, there's a, huh? Lots yeah, of little gall heads. Yeah. See. Oh, yeah, I have a lot. Yeah, I have a small bookcase here. I have some books on the floor there. That's nothing. But I'm going to try to turn this the whole way around, and you'll see my room. Oops. That oh stop it! He's been eating my my my, sh my metal shades. Stupid cat! I don't want to do. Oh my god! And I see teeth mark on my plug. Oh my god! He's gonna I see your off. dolls. My wife yeah, well, anyway, I have a I have a room over there that I don't know if you can see the open door. Maybe not. You see my bedroom, but I'm not going to turn all the way around. But I have a back room that's a study slash library slash crap room. <laughs> stop it! Stop chewing on my look at this. He's chewed this all up. 
He's a he's a mess. Those so that's why those are bent. I it's was, horrible, <laughs> and you stop chewing on them. Cut it out. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> anyway, my back room has piles. I don't collect. I don't keep books anymore. I try not to keep incoming books. I do not keep novels unless they're signed to me. Stop it. Until they're signed to me. Unless they're inscribed to me, and I don't keep anthologies very often, and I only keep mostly collections so that I can for reference. And I have, I have books piled up there. I have bookshelves, three walls of books. Stop it! God damn you! You're embarrassing. You know, That's speaking cool. of that, Ellen, um, you told me once several years ago that I, I, I'm paraphrasing. I think you said something to the effect of, "You're." you no longer really read just for pleasure. Is that still true or is, or is everything you read, is it work related? Most of it is. I take a break every once in a while. I did, I have read a couple of nonfiction books in the last that are not related. Mm -hmm. um, one semi polit one political one and one that was, um, did you, you know about the movie about Scotty, the guy who, um, who like got, connected everybody with sex sexual partners in the 30s 40s and 50s in hollywood there's anyway is um a i think i missed that one there's a documentary that's fabulous about him anyway i bought the book it's called full service and i read that i kind of zoomed through that that yeah. was my guilty I, pleasures <laughs> i'm going to show you something that i have to have to have when i do these shows from for my cats and it's going to change your life this oh, I have it. Yeah, I usually have it. In fact, I know. Let me hear my spray bottle. I have it. I know. Jack, please don't. Please don't. Come Every on. time they do something, they seem to know I'm on the show. So but they he like, seems to like it. He seems to not care anymore. I have that too, and he doesn't seem to care anymore. He gets soaking wet. He like looks at me. He's like, he doesn't care that I spray him with water. Oh, stop it! Cut it out. Well, to to wrap up, you've got a couple of books out there um, that for one reason or another went under my radar okay uh my fault but i wonder if you'd briefly say something about them the first one is uh mad hatters and march hares oh but yes my alice in wonderland anthology i love alice um <laughs> um i love i've always loved alice in wonderland books i collect illustrated alice's in fact and i have some illustrations from barry moser's books um but I was at a convention I was being interviewed and um, we were talking about anthologies I've done and we were talking about the Poe Anthology and Lovecraft Unbound. Do you have to throw you in the bathroom? Stop it. He listens to me for five seconds. <laughs> well, um, he's a but cat. anyway, so someone, in the, said, someone in the audience said, is there any other person, writer, who you'd like to do an anthology inspired by it. And I said, I don't know. Um, it hadn't occurred to me. I said, oh, well, Alice in Wonderland. I love Alice. You know, I love the Alice books. Right. So afterwards, all these mostly women came up to me. Women writers said, oh, we want to be in the book. Please do an Alice in Wonderland book. And so two years later, so I was able to sell it. And so that's how that came about. I mean, I love I love Alice in Wonderland, and I love it. So I, that's one of the few books, that and Poe and Lovecraft Monsters, are the few books that I've actually asked people to tell me what they're going to write about. So I'm sorry, he's making too much noise. Stop it. Shh. Stop. Uh, <laughs> they were the few books that I actually asked people to give me an idea of what they want to write back, write about. So I didn't have too many repetitions of like, I mean, I, as it was at Poe, I got three house of usher stories, but they were very different from each other. And I knew they would be. Um, so that's, something I was aware of. So I asked people, what character do you want to write about? What what kind of aspect of Alice do you think you'll write about? And at a certain point I say, no, no more reflections, no more mirrors, please go away. Stop it. No, you know, I can't, you can't do that. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, I mean, that's an, again, it's a juggling act to make sure you don't get too much of the same thing. If people, you think people latch on to the, a particular character or something there are a couple of stories that actually had lewis carroll in them but not many i mean maybe one or i know one did maybe two um so yeah so i tried to get a good mix of characters and aspects of lewis carroll's work to, to digress a little bit i find that the idea of like using the author as a character i it's really difficult for me to like 
enjoy that sort of book. I mean, there's all kinds of books where Lovecraft is a character. I know, I, I, it's a tough. I don't like it when he's like a detective or something. It just doesn't... It well, doesn't. It's the same thing with Lewis Carroll. It's like, I don't know. It, it well, takes he's away not from a character the in most of them. I mean, he was a character. He might be actually in one story that's more a time of time travel story that's mostly about an alternate world where someone's in debtor's prison and then and then the mad ha the and the, the girl's father is becomes a mad hatter from the mercury but and i think she goes into another universe where charles dodson is lives but mostly it's not that so yeah i have i mean i don't like that too often i mean i think it's a totally different kind of story i mean that's you know famous person stories alternate person i mean i've howard waldrick did those wonderfully i mean ike at the mic which is eisenhower and ellis presley you know doing things that they weren't doing and they can work you know but they're whole different it's a whole different subgenre of most science fiction or fantasy and you can't have a lot i mean you can do a there have been people who've done whole books of those of course you know alternate presidents alternate this and alternate that where you have characters from real life or not, you know, or, or authors doing other things. Like, you know, those are, of course, the stories with um, Jane Austen as a character, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, yeah I've seen, um, in particular, I can't count how many times I've seen Sigmund Freud used as a character in a short story or a book that takes mm -hmm. place in the late 1800s. It's, mm -hmm. it's way overdone, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, and it's like, it's, it's not, true to their personalities usually i mean and the reason i say that is i've i've read stories about people i know i mean people who are mentioned in a story you know a, a real life person who i might actually be acquainted with and i said that's not that person at all and it just feels wrong it's like so i assume the same thing is with the writers who are in put in stories you know the famous dead writers who are put in stories that that's not really what they were like at all and it's just you are you putting your you're you're doing this, but like I, you know, with Jeff Ford's novel, um, I really think it works with Ahab. Well, on the other hand, um, Melville's not in the story at all. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Ishmael is and Ahab is, but the, the characters are in the story, but the author is not. So I don't know. That's a different kind of thing. Yeah. And the other book that went under my radar was uh, Nightmare Carnival. Could you briefly talk about that one? Well, that was a book I did for Dark Horn. Uh, uh, Dark Horse, um, which mostly does comic book comics and doesn't do very well with their books, but they've published three of my anthologies. Um, it was it's basically it was stories about carnivals and circuses, and all original stories and um, some fantasy and some dark fantasy. It had a cover that I hated. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, I shouldn't. Say, I mean, it had a really a good cover, but not what I wanted it to be. I mean, it was a Mike Magnolia cover. I think I think he did it. Well, maybe not. It may not have. But anyway, I did not want a clown on it at all. It did have a clown in it. But it's, it, I mean, I wanted it to I'm be. I'm looking at the cover now. It does not look like Mike Mignola's stuff. No, so, okay. There's he, one that he did. I think it was a different one, but I know what you're talking about because I saw it when I was looking. Yeah. I mean, I just hate the cover. I mean, it's not, I mean, my editor and I talked about it. I showed him examples. I wanted him to use a Ferris wheel, but I wanted a really cool photograph or painting but something not it was too comic-y what they came up with which is dark horse's problem they don't know how to do anything that's not basically i mean they have a real hard time i don't understand why well they stopped buying books for me anyway they probably can't sell any anthology the lovecraft ones do okay i mean i did lovecraft unbound for them which did very well i think and then um uh children of lovecraft i did for them that was a mike magnolia cover and that was a good cover but the nightmare carnival cover i thought was just was terrible i mean it was it just looked like a kid's book a kid's like nightmare book you know with a stupid clown on it i mean at least the clown wasn't in the forefront but he was there and it's like exactly what i didn't want them to do so <laughs> yeah, i can't i'm looking at the cover and i, I can, really can't disagree with that at all no, uh, I mean, this is misleading it's not oh it, and because Dark Horse is mostly comics, everyone's and they I guess they post their books on the comics 
page or someplace, and so people get all pissed off. It's like this isn't a comic. There are no pictures. I said if you looked at the description, it said that it's a te it's not a comic book. It's an anthology jerks. But you know they never have figured out how to sell books, and I don't know why they persist in doing it. Every once in a while, they still do, but not mine. I doubt it's never mine. But they, they, they did a supernatural noir, which I loved, and I'd love to do another supernatural noir, noir anthology. Yeah. I'll say. Anyone else have any questions for Ellen? Just a quick one. You kind of touched on it, but I had, again, it was just a silly question, but as an artist, I was just curious as, yeah, how you came up with, like, the covers for your anthologies and if you got to have any input. So I guess uh, you kind of tell them what you want, but... Uh, mostly, no. <laughs> Most, very few um, authors have any... We have very little say on the covers. Um, I mean, I have cover approval, which be not cover consultation it usually says, which means they can consult with me that, that they can do what they want. Mm -hmm. If I violently hate a cover, they'll sometimes change it. Um, I've been lucky that I've had mostly really good covers. I've had some really abominable covers. So on Fantastique was one of the worst covers I've ever had. <laughs> I, in fact, when I saw the cover, I thought it was a sketch. I didn't realize it was a final cover. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought it was just like a concept thing. And I was like, oh, my God. And it turned out. So, yeah, I've had some horrible covers, and I had no say in them. Uh, and on the other hand, sometimes, if, as I said, if I have, you know, my editors, in-house editor will listen to me if they're about some – on some things about the cover. Um, I was the one who suggested the cover for um, Black Feathers by Rookie mm -hmm. High. I mean, I loved the image. I didn't know that they were going to actually use that image. I had seen that someplace. I don't remember where, and I sent it to them. And it turned out they used the image. They also, the publisher didn't pay her until we bugged him. I mean, <laughs> forgot. That's a common <laughs> art experience. <laughs> I mean, I don't think he did it intentionally. He just, forgot and you know then I don't know the I didn't know the artist personally really and then apparently she tweeted or face it's made something on Facebook about not getting paid and blames me it's like don't blame them and I had no idea Aww, that, you know? Aww, yeah, I mean maybe you shouldn't blame so cool. why didn't you come to me first and tell me we'll go to the publisher first to do something instead of blabbing your mouth mm. um, so then I had to go back to the publisher and check our emails back and forth and I said I thought you paid her I mean you said you were going to pay her the next day or something, or contact her. I gave him the contact info, and he never contacted her. Um, so eventually she did get paid. But anyway, that was a really good cover, and I did that was a cover that I, a piece of art that I loved and recommended. Yeah, I'm so, looking at that yeah, right now. To have something that they, you know, that they'll, work, you know, sometimes they'll listen to you. It totally depends on the mm -hmm. art director and, you know, if they think you're full of garbage or not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Philip. Yeah, sorry, I wanted to unmute. Um, yeah, well, one of the things I wanted to ask, Ellen, while we had you on, and we'll, the other thing was, while I can actually see you somewhat virtually, I wanted to say thank you for putting Failsafe in. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, volume 10. Oh, I'm delighted. I love it. Love it you. was uh, a pinnacle moment for me, so it was, made me very happy. So thank you for that. And um, But I wanted to ask because... Uh, you know, you've been reading pretty much everything that's on the market for the last couple of decades. And, well, at least and some, skimming it, if not reading it at all. <laughs> right. And I'm curious I'm, about the, if you've noticed, because it seems to me from a writer perspective, even, even in the last three or four years, there seem to be some trends in, in horror and what people are writing, what kind of material people, authors are coming up with. And that was based on whether it's the marketplace or based on societal trends or based on what's selling or whatever the case might be. I was wondering if you saw any major trend shifts over the last, you know, 20 years where that were no, no noticeable enough that you would think, you know, would be able to think of them. Like it just, it's cause it seems to me like in the last four or five years, we've really gotten into the whole weird gentle horror and, you know, kind of thing has really taken off. Um, Whereas maybe like a couple of decades ago, you know, more traditional horror was the the way things were. For a while there, it seemed like dark fantasy was hot. But I don't know if that's just me as a reader or as a writer or if you sense those things in your reading, if there are massive trends that kind of sway. Kind of, but more, more um, specific. I mean, to me, I mean, there was a whole period when everything was a zombie story. I mean, everything. Right. 
many, many zombie anthologies and zombie stories. And I swore I'd never, I couldn't stand zombie stories. And then start some of them, they, it slowed down, but some really good ones were coming out. Really, really interesting ones that were terrific. And the same thing happened um, actually two years ago, three years ago, I counted up, there were so many Lovecraftian anthologies out. There was suddenly an explosion of Lovecraftian anthologies, most of them mediocre, or a lot of them, an awful lot of them mediocre, which is what happens yeah. if you have it, you know, in that hap in that case. Um, and then that slowed down last year. I mean, compared to the year before, there were very few. I mean, I can't have, it must have been at least 2025, 20, two years ago or three years ago, I forget when exactly. And then suddenly that kind of stopped. Okay, now just I'll just say that if that is your special interest is Lovecraftian books, it was even worse than that. If you went into self-published or I won't tell that mostly. Or, oh, I mean, after my anthologies, that's what I mostly am talking about. Personally. It's like a yeah. hundred a year. You shouldn't right, keep right. Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as yeah, the the weird fiction. The problem with weird fiction, as far as I'm concerned, I like reading it, but it's not all weird fiction is horror. And not all horror is weird, okay? So I'm looking for horror stuff, and if it's weird but not dark, it can be weird without being horror, and then I have no interest in it. I mean, because as because I'm reading, because I'm always reading with blinkers on, or trying to skim or read with blinkers on, because I'm looking for what goes into my anthology. Um, so I may like stories, I may see a bunch of stories that are interesting and weird, and darkish but not really that dark and to me um it's hard for me to judge them except that they're wasting my time which is totally the wrong way to judge them because they're good stories but as far as my purpose and what i'm reading them for which is the year's best horror right i just dismiss them you know it's like and sometimes i will recommend i put them on my honorable mentions and sometimes i won't if they're if i think they're too lightweight but if i think it's a really terrific story anyway i might add it anyway but i'm not going to take it for years best because it's not dark it's not horror it's not dark enough and it's not horror um so i'm finding i'm finding a lot more dark fantasy published than horror right. and short fiction i'm mostly talking about short fiction i don't read you know, there's, you know i don't read that many novels so I can only really judge the short fiction that I see. And so much more of it is dark fantasy. Sometimes, now in, in a magazine or a book that seems to be mixed genre, like Asimov's, sometimes I'll start reading it. I'll, I'll read the heading and see if it's supposed to be dark. Sometimes I'll skip to the end to see if, how depressing it is at the end, if it's happier, if someone dies or someone, if, you know, if people die at the end, and if they survive and they walk off happily into the woods, then I know it's not horror. So I'm not going to read it, even though it may be a really good story. It's like I don't have time for this. I can't read it. It's not what I'm looking for. Right. So in that sense, I'm not a good judge of what's out there. I mean, I know it's out there, and I know some of it's really good, and I can see that, but it's not what I'm looking for. So I kind of dismiss it from my brain, you know, after I look at it. Um. But there's a lot of, I mean, there really is great, there is good, really good horror fiction out. It's funny, this year I, it seemed that there were a lot fewer anthologies out, or maybe I'm not getting them, I'm starting to get some in more now than I had the first half of the year. But it seemed to me I was getting way too little stuff. And I think, I don't know if the anthologies, the original anthologies have dropped off or if it's just I haven't gotten many of them yet. So that's disturbing to me. Um, is that a trend? I don't know. It may just, it may be just a blip and maybe that I'm just not getting them yet that people are waiting to send them to me. I don't know. No. Yeah. Um, other than, so, I mean, you know, so yeah, do you see weird fiction as a, I mean, there's definitely more weird fiction out there and I like it, but it's not what I'm looking for if it's not dark enough. Right. It's, uh, I think the word they use is strange, like Robert Aikman. Mm -hmm. Reggie, Ol Reggie well, Oliver. Even with horror, though, and Reggie Oliver is horror usually. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're dark enough to be considered horror, so it depends on what you mean by weird fiction, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's what I mean. It's sort of strange. It just seems like does that the strange fiction market, strange fiction horror market seems to be booming right now. There seems to be a lot of writers kind of focusing on strange fiction and socio political stuff, and maybe it's just me as a reader, but it seems to be trending and i was wondering if you caught any of that or if it's no just... what i have found and i find it really depressing is that there's very little science fiction being published these days that i have noticed it most seems like people are not writing science fiction they're writing fantasy i mean you know and i have nothing against that 
but people calling science, things science fiction that are not at all science fiction. And it's like, don't call it that. It's not that. And I feel badly because there seems to be a lot less of it, you know. And as I said, I'm not really reading that much, but I, even in the story, in the stories that I read that are supposed purportedly science fiction, it's like they're not. Right. Friday the 13th in space does not make it science fiction. <laughs> I right. have a question about the whole well, lack true. of science fiction. Oh, sorry. Depends. sorry, go on. Mm. Well, I was kind of wondering if maybe we're having less science fiction now because it's not much different from what we're all experiencing right now since our technology has advanced so quickly. Maybe we're having trouble imagining what science fiction would now be and to escape and have stuff that, like, fires our imagination, we kind of revert to fantasy because a medieval setting is much different than what we have now because we're kind of living in a science fiction setting now. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if that's it. Well, there's some things, I mean, certainly, um, there was, I've been in discussions about this, about space exploration. There are certain things you can't do in science fiction anymore because you know that Mars is not like this. Venus is not like that. So you can't have this going on in Venus. So, but I know there are really great, I've been reading really great science, sto science fiction stories about space, about space exploration. And, um, it's always what you're going to do with the technology. I mean, even, I mean, it's always what if, you know, and, if, and you know, just even judging 20 years ahead, how is, where is cloning going? Where is, um, where are medical uh, advan advances going? So, I mean, some things it's more difficult. Well, science fiction has always been more difficult. You have to do research. You, yes, you fudge the material, but you still have to do the research to make it sound right. So yeah, that's true, because you can't just be like, it's science. magic. Anyone, anyone can write fantasy. I mean, anyone who writes and writes well can write fantasy, but you have to do research to do science fiction, no matter what kind of science fiction it is. If it's futuristic, if you're, even if, it, if it's sociological science fiction, anthropological science fiction, you still have to do some research, which... In a short story for fantasy, it depends if it's third world. I mean, if it's um, other, what do you call it? Imaginary world fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you have to do, well, you have to imagine it, I guess. And you can use, you know, a lot of fantasy has used medieval times or earlier and other, you know, and other people's um, anthropolo anthropology to mm -hmm. create interesting fantasy. Um, I just think science fiction is more difficult and people are, don't want to, I don't know. I mean, they're, I, or they've been told that what they're writing is science fiction, but it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you're talking short stories, right? So it yeah, certainly seems to me that, yeah, that there's sorry, still a lot of science fiction novels being put out there. It, yeah, there's, a, there's still a lot of science fiction novels out there. Yeah. But it's harder, I think, to find real science fiction stories. Uh, okay, well, anything else that we haven't covered that you've got coming up that you can talk about or did we cover everything? Are you asking me or them? You, you. <laughs> oh, me. oh, I don't know. Um, uh, maybe we covered everything. I don't know. I've got a question though. Um, what about personal appearances? Are you having any of those coming up? Um, I'm going to be in Boscone. I'll be at Boscone this year, next year in February. I haven't been there in like 25 years or something. I was going, I'm going to go because um, Liz Hand's guest of honor and Gardner was guest of honor. So I wanted to go to hang out with them. And I hadn't been since I was at Omni, I don't think, because they, you know, since someone paid my way, but I decided to go to Boston for them. So I forget what date that is, but that's February. And I'll be going to ICFA in March um, in Orlando. Um, I'll be in Florida next week, but I don't do anything there. I mean, I'm in Boynton Beach with my mom. Are you planning on going to StokerCon next year? Oh, yeah, year? I'll, be, I'll be at StokerCon. Unfortunately, I will be missing the next Necronomicon, which is not this year, but the next year, whatever. I mean, I when I was guest of honor, they had asked me a few times, and I couldn't do it because it always conflicted with WorldCon. And finally, when I did it this past year, it was a week after WorldCon. I came back from Finland three days later. I had to go to Providence, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, but the next time it's happening is when I think the world kind of is going to be in New Zealand or someplace, <laughs> but someplace I'm going to be, you know? Um, so I think I'm going to miss Necronomicon again. Um, yeah, I'm going to Stoker Con for sure. 
Right. And that's, and actually, that's like four days after I come back from Italy. I'm going to Italy on vacation in April. And like Stoker Con is like four days in someplace in Michigan. Um, Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids. Yeah, which I've never been to. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I will definitely be there. I'll be I'll there. Be there also. I'll probably be jet lagged, but I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll be at World. Oh, I'll be at World Fantasy in a few weeks, you know, in Baltimore. All right. Well, the again, the title of the book is The Best of the Best Horror of the Year, 10 Years of Essential Short Horror Fiction. Uh, comes out October 2, but uh, who knows? Maybe this 1099 is a pre-order price, so certainly get on Amazon and pre-order it uh, because you're going to want to read it. And I, again, I did provide a link in the show notes so mm -hmm. thank you ellen for being on the show really great to see you you're welcome and phil you're gonna you're gonna email me yes ma'am i already forgot about what oh yeah the book <laughs> <laughs> i have to see if i have a copy round make up Darn. a few other things too philip <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me on again it's great yes thank you for being here so. okay take care bye ellen. bye thank everyone you. nice bye. seeing you bye you. pleased to meet bye. you lovely to meet you all great thank you bye all right, um, we're going to talk about Castle Rock, but we're going to, since it's the, the last episode has happened, but we're going to wait till the end uh, in case uh, to avoid, because we are going to talk about spoilers. So people can turn us off at the end if they haven't seen the, was it the eighth episode or tenth episode, Ben? Bella? Oh, no, there were ten. It's ten. the tenth, yeah. Right, ten episodes never mind I'll keep, my, I'll keep my mouth shut until we get there 10 hours i'll never get back <laughs> yes exactly uh there's a new book out called pickman's gallery i uh, don't remember the editor but uh sounds like garbage yeah i don't know it, lo it looks like it could be good hot mess yeah edited by matthew carpenter i, oh, geez. I just sorry remember. do you want to talk about that for a second matt it's out now so sure um Sam Gafford is the uh, gaffer over at um, Old Fire Press, and uh, he likes putting out an occasional Lovecraftian anthology, um, you know, with the goal that it's going to be in, press, in print for a long time and gradually uh, earn its keep that way. So we, every approximately two years we've been doing, it's from a slush pile, we do an open call for stories related to Pikmin, and we didn't really have a specific set of themes other than that. We wanted the authors to let their whims go where they would. And we got close to 150 submissions again. I read them all. Wowzers. <laughs> and narrowed it down to about 30 for a first cut. We read all of those and we ended up with uh, 17 stories. And I'm really pretty happy that it's a, Pretty good read. I think most of the readers will enjoy it. Um, uh, there's some people that I've never heard of before as authors somewhere. I think it might be one of their first few publications and others who have interests other than weird fiction and somehow this uh, caught their attention. Uh, some people are well known to this group like uh, Peter Rollick is one of the authors. Um, but uh, it was a uh, all in all, a very satisfying experience at the end. Although I gotta say, for about a year, it was like things were stuck in second gear. And now it's uh, freely available on Amazon. Unfortunately, after I went through the editing, like there, we had done some edits on the first book, which was called um, "A Lonely and Curious Country." Right, great title. And none of them none of the corrections appeared in the final version. And then I got, how did that happen? I don't know. I don't, I don't understand anything. Okay. And then I got, you know, flack that like, this is a poorly edited anthology. And I'm going, well, yeah, you're right. God, who's that idiot? So this one, we did another serious round of copy edits. Each author got to go through it. I went through each story twice again. And yeah, that's fun, isn't it? But then we, uh, he sent in the final version, and uh, basically the bottom of 10 of the stories was cut off. <laughs> so 
So the first 15 or so people who bought the book got a damaged copy. And so those had to be replaced. And now I believe what is available for Amazon is the final version. Well, I'm looking at it on Amazon right now. And for those of you, I know many of you are on Kindle Unlimited, it's free to read. So that's a good thing uh, if you're on Kindle Unlimited. And it's also available in paperback. Uh, looks like $15.72. So. Um, you know, he is doing other things. He's very much a uh, William Hope Hodgson fan, and he publishes yeah. a book called Sargasso, which is um, a, 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 a scholarly journal about Hodgson. And he has a couple other books uh, coming out uh, through Ulfar Press. So uh, it's really, it's, it, this was a very nice opportunity, I thought, for authors to like, you know, Ellen says she only does submitted work. And I think, like, for example, Brian Salmon's, he only takes solicited work. I mean, um, they don't want, you know, cold submissions. Uh, so this was an opportunity for people who weren't, uh, you know, in with the uh, editors to have a chance to get something published. Yeah, and that's important because there's some diamonds in the rough out there in those slush piles. But it, it is hard going through those slush piles. You know, ever since um, I, I, I've always wanted there to be a, a ever since the uh, print arm of uh, for short fiction of uh, easing uh, was sort of set aside because of other demands. I always wanted to have an avenue for new authors to at least submit work. Um, and so probably in another year or so, we might be coming up with another title. OK. Uh, Soren Narnia of Knife Point Horror, uh, the Knife Point Horror podcast. Uh, I talked with him the other day uh, for a Patreon podcast, and I believe I'll be able to post that tomorrow for all you patrons. It was a really good conversation. We talked about Knife Point Horror, and then for some reason we started waxing philosophic on life, the universe, and everything. And I do think that we gave the answers to at least life. I don't know about the universe and everything, but yeah. So if, if you're curious about the secret of life, you might, you know, and you're a patron, you might check that out tomorrow. Uh, meaning Monday the 17th. I think I'll have it up by then. If you're not a patron, it's just five bucks a month. There's a lot of ex great extra content there. So um, Kelly Young is not here. Therefore, I will definitely not uh, plug his new podcast, Dead Again Podcast, at www.deadagainpodcast.com. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. But, so, since, but since he's not here, it's a good time to make personal remarks. Yes, absolutely. Kelly gets I, more I'm plugs sure in his. will never listen to this. Kelly gets more plugs in his absence than he does in, when he's here. That's true. You got, you got me wearing his silly shirt. You're plugging his podcast. I just said I was not plugging the podcast. Next thing you know, we're going to be talking about the next issue of Strange Eons available now. Well, I think you guys were bitching before the show that you didn't have your copies yet. I don't have my copy. My it's copy. I, mean, I am sure it's on its way. Well, Kelly mentioned that Philip's shirt is one of three, so I'm curious. Are there only three issues of the latest Strange Eons as well? And that's why I don't get one. <laughs> if they're printing no, three issues usually, at a time. They're usually they're, very good about that. Their business model is flawed. Guys, I have to show you my Lovecrafting t-shirt that is one of one. Okay. Okay, let's see right. it. You probably can't up. see it. Oh, there we go. Mother Landry. It says, yeah, it says Mother Landry, and it has a Cthulhu on it. My nice. friend painted it in bleach for me. So oh, it's like right, Mother right. Hydra and Father Dagon, but Mother Landry. Whoa, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah, she's that's the great. wonderful woman who is currently sitting my children in the other room as they keep pounding on my door trying to get in. I haven't heard a thing. Um, okay. the mute button. News, and now it's time for news. Uh, Henry Cavill out as Superman. I don't know if we're crying about that or not. You know, oh, I, oh, is that official? I heard it was, a, it was he's, a rumored. Yeah, he's. if you read the true, um, not true, I would say the Hollywood Reporter story, 
They take that he couldn't do a Shazam cameo and then extrapolated this great long article about how that must yeah. mean that he can't do Superman ever again. I think he's I think he's I think it's bullshit, Mike. I think uh really I think it's fake news. Well what I've read is that he, he's saying it's the DC universe is to forget about continuity and just do individual movies like Shazam and Wonder Woman and you know that sort of thing. So well, I did hear that they're focusing on Supergirl. That's that's where they want to put all their chips uh, in the foreseeable future. Okay. Uh, for the Superman franchise, Supergirl is going to be their focus, they said. They're very excited about doing a Supergirl movie. Oh, what, okay. I, what I've noticed with these articles is sort of what Philip was saying, that um, talking in a negative way about the DC Universe, which, granted, many of the films have definitely deserved... Um, gets a lot of attention online and a lot of clicks. Yeah, so a lot of it's clickbait, yeah. Even, I mean, it's disappointing that even the trades, such as Variety and Hollywood Reporter, are kind of going that route. But reading the article directly and not like the CBR version or all of these kind of paraphrases, it's, there's nothing, there's no, a, a, not they don't even have a source claiming that he's out. They just have a source discussing what would happen if he did leave. And... He himself was making fun of it on his Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I'm I just hope none of those. Out. I just hope none of those animated mermen from Aquaman leave, so that we can see them in all their glory. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it's just the stupidest trailer ever. Matt uh, Carpenter has been bitching for the longest time about me showing cold skin on. Uh, on the Saturday night movie night, and uh, Matt, it's it just came out on the ninth. No, is what it? I've been bitching about is you won't show big ass spider. No, I'm not going to show big ass spider. Is cold skin good, Matthew? Um, big ass spider is. Cold oh. skin is now available. It looks really good on a the remote book was, island. The book is good. I haven't seen it. I'm waiting for Mike to like pay the two bucks. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, yeah, I make a lot more money than you do, so I'll do that. Uh, on a remote island in the Ant Antarctic Circle, a young man finds himself trapped in a battle for his life against nightly invasions of unknown creatures that emerge from the ocean. Who knows? There could be some Lovecraftian themes in here. It's certainly... Everything that I've been hearing is that it's good. It's now available on Amazon streaming to buy and to rent. The trailer actually does some very good job of setting the mood of the isolation of this lighthouse. And how you know, I really love that kind of story, Matt. Lighthouses and the isolation of it. And I, I'm looking forward, uh, all kidding aside, I'm looking forward to watching this. I am too. Uh, Matthew, did you read the book or just see the movie? Read? Okay. <laughs> well, it's not a... He's waiting for the Reader's Digest version to come out. It's not a. It's not even a graphic novel. It's like a real, like there's no pictures or anything with so. words oh. and everything. Yeah. Books. I just, I just, I just, I just, I just finished this John Le Carre book. So, okay, so you do. Read. All right. But Cold Skin is a good book if people want to search out the book. It's an excellent book. I don't okay. know about the movie. I can't speak for the movie. Okay. I, I don't want anything to ruin the film for me. I know that's pretty lame, but. Stand by for news. Okay, here's a new book that just came out. Uh, Doorbells at Dusk, Halloween Stories. Mm -hmm. It's uh, $3.99 on Kindle on Amazon, $14.99 paper, paperback, edited by um, somebody. Evans Light is his name. I don't know who that is, but this book is getting good reviews, and it's a Halloween anthology so i'm gonna buy it josh mallerman's in it yeah i know josh is in it i don't know who else Door yeah. not doorbells at dusk is that the salerno press uh book uh corpus press okay yeah the again the title is doorbells at dusk halloween stories uh josh mallerman is the only name that i recommend recognize on there but no i no ian welk is is on there ian welkie and amber <laughs> fallon i recognize those names uh but again this is getting real good reviews and you guys know what a sucker i am for for halloween stories um what hey mike can i say one thing no. 
which is that it kind of came and went very quickly during Ellen's interview, but that's kind of a big reveal that Victor Laval is writing a sequel to the Ballad of Black Tom. I mean, that's kind of a big deal. That that novella was massive when it came out, and now there's going to be an AMC series. And the fact that there's a sequel is, I thought, was pretty cool. I'm really excited. Right about that. We did well, hear you know, okay, you know, when we talk about the book uh, Lovecraft Country, which dealt with the racism in a very vivid way. That's the jo uh, Jordan Peele's doing that. Right. One, right? The, the, well, the, the strange fiction part of it was, for me, only okay. It was, you know, as far as being a strange or weird or Lovecraftian fiction type novel, that part of it was secondary to the way that he depicted the racism that was experienced by the people who lived then. Whereas I thought The Ballad of Black Tom was a great weird fiction novel also. So you enjoyed Battle of a Black Tom. It sounds like more than Lovecraft Country. Yeah, it's not that I didn't. I, I didn't dislike. I, I'm sorry. I, I did not dislike uh, Lovecraft Country. I just thought the uh, weird fiction story, if you remove it from the context, it, it wasn't anything special. Okay. You know, but whereas the Ballad of Black Tom, it's a very well crafted weird fiction novel novella also. I would argue Ballad of Black Tom is more weird fiction by far than the story it's based on. Rick. I also like the fact that it's real it's got social commentary relevant to the day. Yes. Yes, that's what I was bringing up with uh, Ellen regarding the way the two police officers are handled and how the racism was different. Right. Where you had the the one that was the um, outright, you know, racist that was abusive and attacking people, and then you had the other detective, which was the hero of the horror Red Hook, who, at first, you think, oh, he's not such a bad guy, and then you start seeing more of the systemic elements of racism through him. Well, the the, the other guy was based on Robert E. Howard too. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you for pointing that out again, Philip, because that that is a big reveal. Heard it here uh, first. Yes, you heard it here first. Zachary Quinto and Ashley Cummings to lead AMC's Nosferatu series. Yeah, I don't get that at all. Why? Because he's not old. He's a young man. Oh, and wait. He is a young man, yes. And Nosferatu, what uh, Manx is an old man. He's so I'm, I guess there maybe there's recasting or re reimagining Manx, Charlie Manx. I don't know. Maybe there's some makeup involved. But but okay, then I then I cry, I cry ageism. <laughs> Why can't old people play old people? Well, damn old it. people should play old people. Hey, if uh, you know what's her face. The black pumpernickel, Scarlett O'Hanson can't do whatever she wants to do. I don't know. It yeah. just seems if you're gonna if you're gonna have a guy who's who's seventy years old, I, uh, cast a seventy year old actor. Yeah, that's the now. It's been a, I mean, I haven't read the book since it came out, but I remember him. He's technically he's over a hundred. Then he right. de ages to like seventy. Right, and Christopher Plummer would be good as Charlie okay. Mix. You know, Max von Sydow is probably not doing anything. He's about just the right age. Is he alive still? I don't he, think he's alive. I, he, so I don't think he would take any calls on that. Sean Connery is uh, alive, but I believe he's uh, inaccessible to the public. Well, the he's, last, he's retired. The yeah. last movie I saw Max von Sydow in was in The Force Awakens. He, he's still alive. He's in his 80s, but he's still alive. Uh, God, I loved him in, uh, what was it, uh, that Robin Williams afterlife story. Oh, what dreams may come. Yeah. I he still was great in that. I think of him as in the seventh seal. Wasn't he yeah. in Strange Brew? Yes. As Thank well you. as Tony. He's the Bond type build in Strange Brew. Strange Brew. That would, no, that's a film. Uh, that's I'll it. always remember him for The Exorcist, of course. Well, anyway, if you're a fan of Nosferatu, Nosferatu, the book, it, it's going to be an AMC series. So if you didn't know that's, that, you know that now. That's AMC yeah. as well, huh? It so is AMC as AMC well. AMC is snatching up horror. That's interesting. I guess well, Walking who, Dead. Who wrote the book? I'm only familiar with Joe Hill. Joe Hill, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, Derek Mears cast as Swamp Thing in the upcoming DC Universe television series. This is the guy who played Jason Voorhees in the 2009 Friday the 13th reboot. He's also played a Predator and many other aliens and creatures of the night over the course of his career. I am reading from horrornewsnetwork.net. So, I don't know, are we looking forward to the Swamp Thing television series? Are we looking forward to DC Universe at all? Now, is this the DC digital platform, or to yes. only yes. subscription yes. only? Oh. Yes, it's sort of like uh, Hulu or whatever, but it's I, I don't think I would pay 20 bucks a month to watch DC's original content. Well, the, here's the problem. I would, but there's not a lot of original content. It went live the other day. I loaded the channel onto my Roku. I pulled it up, and because I was like, okay, I'm going to watch Titans. I want to see what this is about. Titans is not on there. It's not available until October. So you got, like, the Wonder Woman, the 70s Wonder Woman. You got animated series, and then you got a bunch of comic books that you can read on your TV, which... No, thank you. I, I mean, I, I love reading comics on my Kindle from Comixology, but I'm, I'm not going to read comics on my TV. Come on. That's and, pushing and it. I, for me, the problem with Swamp Thing is that I don't think it's one of the stories that really lends itself to a live-action platform. I think a lot of what made Swamp Thing popular, I just don't know how you translate that over. And I think uh, the, I mean, the the movies we got were not exactly classics to begin with. Whoa, 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 whoa! Swamp Thing is one of the greatest films ever made. Do you not remember that Adrian Barbeau was in that? That movie, I must have seen. Oh, I remember. That movie a hundred times when I was a kid. That, okay, the, that's a classic. But the return is something to be desired. The series, uh, yeah. I'm quoting again. The series is supposedly heavily based on the seminal Alan Moore run of the 80s. So technically the second film was as well with Heather Locklear. I um, and that was horrible. I did not watch but, that one. I don't And, and the uh, the TV the, series. The words Heather, Heather Locklear are, are in the anywhere in the movie I don't really tend to I, I stopped watching Swamp well, Thing stuff after the Legend of Boggy Creek. Well, will they have the uh the crafty monster that Alan Moore created that Ended up being referenced by Ramsey Campbell in the tugging. I we have limited information at this point. No, I know. I just I'm just saying that maybe there may be a great old, we may have a great old one. That would be if nice. I, follow Alan Moore. I will say I am looking forward to the uh, the ranting by Alan Moore that will happen when this series finally hits. <laughs> he, just, he is. Uh, I mean, I, I understand DC did him wrong, but uh, it's always kind of unfortunate how bitter he's gotten over the years regarding this stuff. Um, and every time they come out with a new property, reporters just go after him regarding them. And it well, he, they he just, they just moved the the Watchmen universe into the DC universe, and I'm not rich, so I've not been able to read them yet. I got to wait for for the collections to come out, but I don't think he's very happy about that either. Uh, Heather, you you said you have a short horror comic on Comixology for 99 cents right now? Oh, yeah. Uh, I will plug it. Yeah, I think plug it's that. on sale for 99 cents until like the 27th or something. They're having some kind of 65% off sale right now on the site on a lot of their stuff. Uh, my comic's called The Killing of dreams i think it's like 45 pages or something okay and it's basically this horror story based on a nightmare i had once and it's like this real close set snow lock village surreal horror story and i guess warning like this is anything bad in my opinion but like the two girl best friends are like in love with each other and the story and etc but if that kind of thing is horrible and awful to you don't read it uh, <laughs> I mean, you mean gay people? I I would hope not. Yeah, I know. Seriously, it's like 2018. But okay, the title again: "The Killing of Dreams." The Killing of Dreams. It's on Comicsology mm -hmm. for 99 cents at the moment. I will I will totally pick that up. There's been a lot of sales on Comicsology lately. Uh, I picked up a few Batman titles. Big surprise, I know. <laughs> uh, but I will I will pick that up too. That sounds 
That sounds great, Heather. I, I didn't know. There's like monsters and horror and awfulness and evisceration, and you're just going to love it. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> evisceration, you're going to love it. So, let, well, let's all support Heather and get that, the, get the killing of dreams on Comixology, if you, if you read on Comixology. Uh, here's a, uh, Here's uh, an important news item from, what is this, AV Club. Fortnite has been cited. <laughs> I can't even read this. Fortnite has now been cited in more than 200 divorce proceedings. Hilarious. <laughs> I've never played that game. Has I want to know how to play it. Has anybody here played Fortnite? My son is obsessed with it. The The amount of effort it took me to get him to stop playing so I could do the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, his Overwatch caused any divorces? I know people are obsessed with that right now. I mean, or it's just... Fortnite's so much bigger than Overwatch. And oh, okay. My wife and I laugh, because he's 10 years old, and we hear from the other room, we hear him yelling into the microphone, dude, dude, bro, Stop, bro. Oh, you nerd, bro, bro. Just constant stream of content. Kill, kill, kill. Well, uh, tell him if he keeps it up, he's going to get divorced. So <laughs> He's still in that age where, like, girls have cooties and he doesn't want to admit that he talks to them or plays with them at school. And Right. I don't know. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's funny to me because I know that at his age I was playing, you know, Doom or something. Um. I mean, this is back in the ancient days, but... Uh, oh, please. Just stop it. it. You are so lucky. My boys have never been at that age. Even when they were babies, we'd go take them to eat or whatever, and they see the waitress come up, and they're like, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> I live my days in terror. <laughs> I have to ask Ben a question. Why are you wearing a Bruno San Martino t-shirt? Because he's one of the greatest pro wrestlers of all time. And he passed away not long ago, which is when I got this shirt. And so it's kind of, uh, it's one of my favorite things. He was, uh, if you've ever heard him interviewed, he lived such a fascinating life where he grew up. Um, he was a child during World War II. And so he lived in Italy and his mother took him and his siblings up into the mountains to hide from the fascists. And also, like, he got pneumonia and he almost died, and she had to sneak down to get them food. And then he came to America, and he's a sick, frail kid. And uh, he started, you know, going to the gym and training. And then he became the biggest pro wrestler for decades back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So I've always just been a big fan of kind of his story and his life. Okay. Uh, there is a new uh, interactive fiction game for phones, and until just a few days ago, it was only available for iPhones. And uh, I, the advertisers, full disclosure, are, I mean, excuse me, the creators, full disclosure, are advertising with me. And I said to them, you know, I posted about this, and I told you this would happen, that everyone would get pissed off because there's a hell of a lot of Android uh, users out there and they see this game and they're like, geez, we really want to play this. And that's the comments that I got on the Facebook page. And uh, as I said last week, my respect for them went up a thousand percent because they said, well, we're actually really close and we're based on your comments. We're going to, we're going to do an open beta. So go to the, if you've got an Android, go to the Google play store, search for um, Cthulhu Chronicles, and I posted about it again on the Easy and Facebook page after this happened, and the comments were like, along the lines of, oh, hell, this is a hell of a lot better than I expected. It's really, really good, so, you know, try it out. Uh, and, I, and I don't take money from people that I don't believe in, so it's this is a pretty cool game, and if you're a Especially if you're from the age of Infocom and Zork and Trillium and, you know, all those interactive fiction games, you're going to love this. And if you're not, uh, it's like being the main character in your own book, I suppose. Best way to describe it. Uh, it check it out. Again? I beg your pardon? What was the name again? The name again is Cthulhu Chronicles and is now available on Android and for iPhone. 
So, uh, and every comment I'm getting, public comments, um, unsolicited, are that this is really, really good. And uh, so, uh, what else do we have to talk about? Um, anything, guys? Anyone else have anything before we get to Castle Rock? Yeah, coming up in October, just for those of you who are interested, will be the Labyrinth Index by Charlie Strauss, his latest book in his laundry series. So if, if you're following along um, for the last, I don't know how many years, uh, the latest is going to be coming out soon. Okay. All right. Um, just um, a quick nostalgia thing. I read this uh, uh, Strange Origins comic when I was a kid, uh, 1987. I was like, I don't know, 17, 16. Anyway, it was four possible origins of the Phantom Stranger. And I really love that character, DC character, the Phantom Stranger. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's never, he was never really given an origin, which is, which is great. You know, it made him a lot more mysterious. But the four, one of them was written by Alan Moore. The four possible origins of the Phantom Stranger in this, uh, all four of them were so great. Um, you know, if you're if you're into the Phantom Stranger or just you know a comic geek like me, check that out. It's on Comixology. I think it was just a dollar ninety nine. Um, I don't remember which strange eons it was, but you could just Google. Phantom Stranger, you know, four origins, and you'll get the title, and then from there you can go to Comixology. So, with that said, and everyone disinterested in probably what I just said, no, not. Head. I Let, actually I agree with you. It's a it's a great comic. Um, I, I mean, my memory is going. I thought it was a Secret Origins issue, but I'm. It is. I don't it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's. Um, one thing I will say is you don't have to be familiar with the character at all to enjoy no. the the comic. It's it's really um, I don't want to say too much more about the actual content because it's there's not really anything to spoil, but it's really enjoyable to kind of experience it firsthand. And philosophical and yes, uh, I don't know. I, I just really really loved it. I I posted about it on my personal Facebook page and. You know, I got a lot of, I didn't think I'd get any comments. I got a lot of immediate comments. John Langan was like, oh man, that was a great one. So I think it resonated with a lot of people. Um, so anyway, uh, Castle Rock, if you've not seen all episodes of Castle Rock, you might want to turn us off at this point, And then we're going to end the show after we talk about Castle Rock. So has everyone here seen it or not care? Um, I haven't seen it, but I don't mind. Okay. Spoil me. Sorry. I don't. I well, don't. I don't even know if we can really. Every time you come on the show, Heather. <laughs> I don't know if we can really call it spoilers because it's not like we can tell you what happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to actually know what the hell happened in order to spoil. So, I was somebody. about to say, somebody tell me what the fuck happened. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I got a theory about what happened. Okay, go. Okay. We got these guys traveling back between. Earth 1 and Earth 2, two parallel Earths. I think that whenever a guy travels who's, who's not native to, to the Earth he's going to, he gets possessed by a, a lurker in the gateway. And that's why the kid turned into a demon. It was Henry. And what, what the uh, demon was trying to do, he wanted to bring the white Henry Diva back to his own dimension, but he, if you listen very carefully, he wanted the black one to go with him, so so that would have been his new body if they went back to Earth 2. Okay. I mean, that's that's better than than what they hinted at in the episode itself. Yeah, it's better than what we got. Philip? Well, I mean, I don't. You know, I don't know. I mean, I've been, I've been down on this show from the get-go, and since episode six, five or six or so, but um, I think they just kind of did what they did with Lost, which was they just kind of thought they would sort of tell, a, you know, meander along with these characters and make weird things happen, and 
keep teasing, keep teasing, keep teasing, and then not really know where it was going. And I introduce characters that never went anywhere, like the couple from, yep. from Iowa who yep. turned into serial killers. Yep. I mean, they, 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 then you never see them again. I mean, what the hell? Or characters that did, did introduce storylines that didn't go anywhere. Um, and it, it just was like a, it was a mess. It was a from a from a story perspective. Because I don't want to get into the acting, and I don't want to get into the production value, because I think those are exceptional. But from a storytelling perspective, it was a hot mess. They did. It was not a story. There was no. There was no beginning, middle, and end. There was no resolution. There was and no plot. There was no plot. And to make it even worse, I posted on the. I don't know. I think it was on Kelly Young's Facebook page the other day. I posted that article where they interview the creators and writers of the show. They freely admit that they have no idea how they, what, what was happening. They oh admit it in the God. interview. They were like, it's up to the user, it's up to the reader to come up with their own interpretation for what happened, which is like the worst thing you could say. And, and I'll say this I was talking, you know, Kelly and I were talking about it the other day. And I think there was a time in the old network days when this kind of thing would not have happened because the big, bad, you know, creatively stunted, you know, executive from the studio would have, who's paying for all this would have stepped in and said, guys, you need to have a clean story, you know, through story here. And I think what guys like Hulu and Amazon are doing is they're just sort of giving the artist carte blanche. Um, and to its detriment, in this case, uh, this was a scenario where, you know, they stuck Stephen King's name on I, this, I, this uh, whatever this. You yeah, know, if Stephen King's name wasn't on this. If this wasn't Castle Rock, if it was like nowhere, Minnesota, right. who would be interested? Nobody, and it would still it would make even less sense. The only thing they could, which really, which is really too bad, because they plugged and plugged and plugged and plugged that this is the Stephen King story. And every advertisement they had was like, like we're throwing out these and all his books. And they made it very much like this is going to be a big playground of all these great Stephen King characters and bring the Stephen King universe together. And it's going to be needful things meets, you know, the Shawshank Redemption meets the shining or whatever the case is. And it meets it. And they didn't do any of that. They just told their own story that didn't go anywhere, that made no sense. And they threw out a couple really forced throwaway lines um, that referred to Stephen King story, you know, maybe the name of a character or something. And if the place, yeah, if the city wasn't, if it wasn't called Castle Rock, if the name of the town wasn't called Castle Rock, it would have had absolutely nothing to do with Stephen King. That's J.J. Abrams. That's what he does. He takes a mediocre story. He throws a huge name on it, like Cloverfield, and he and he sells it. And he's a he's a you know he's a snake oil salesman sometimes. Did anybody everybody see the after credit scene? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, it wasn't. Uh, it, I mean, I, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but I would say that after credit scene is exactly what Philip was just talking about, where they're. They're throwing random Stephen King references and comments yeah. right on the nose. Like, oh, look, she mentioned using an axe. Oh, look, she mentioned Overlook Hotel. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's very much that kind of, hey, we're Stephen King, wink, wink, without actually having anything out beneath the surface. I agree. Yeah, and, the st and the, even the even the more dramatic episodes where, like, he, the prison, the prison guard, becomes possessed, I guess, by the demon, I guess, <laughs> um, and shoots everyone in the prison or the, or the kids walking or, you know, walks into that one episode where he walks into the house and the family starts arguing and they all end up killing each other. Um, I guess we think it just didn't make any sense. And, and then at the end and the whole like voice of God thing, you have to sit in this box in the RV and the, who are the, who are the guys who are driving in the RV? That was never explained. And who killed him? And right. Blah, who blah, killed blah. him? That was never explained. And who, uh, what, yeah. what's up with the priest father? What moving his grave? That made no sense. Like nothing. Why went, was that even in there? Who nothing cares? they introduced ever resolved. Nothing ever went anywhere. And it was, and it's, it's just too bad. It's really sad because these guys had, nobody will ever have, what these guys had to play with. They had more content 
to choose from. They could have made the coolest show in the world, and they blew it. And they botched it. And um, and uh, like there's a we're there's there's part of that last episode where they're kind of flipping between realities. And I think I mentioned to so you, you and Kelly, and Mike, we were talking about it. And they were kind of zooming around, and they were showing the birds in the sky. And I was like, if they had shown like a glimpse of the dark tower in the background, I would have been hooked for life. That's all I would have needed. Like, no, look, it's the dark tower that's caught. It's like we're in the multiverse, and this is all part of the dark. I would have been hooked for life, but they couldn't even do that. Like, they couldn't even have like a glimpse of the dark tower. They couldn't have. They get a pain. Like if it was, like if it was me, if I was in charge of that story, Castle Rock, my first season would have been the origins of Pennywise the Clown, which would have been so fun, and so and uh, especially since they cast that actor. Yeah, the, which the they, which is even extra frustrating. <laughs> now, they, now here's like, a here's a story that utilizes the Dark Tower and parallel Stephen King worlds that was done so well. Uh, Ur, do you remember that story? It was the yeah. Kindle exclusive, the the first Kindle exclusive. Yes, yes. and it, oh, it is such a great story. Uh, I don't know if it's still now only available on Kindle. I don't. I just don't know. He included it in um, one of the short story collections afterwards. I think bizarre, isn't it? Is it in Bizarre? Yes. Bad Dreams, the new one. Yes, it is. Okay, Ur is U R for those who haven't read it, and it's so great, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. That, that's the one with the. So it's it's sort of it's a digital device. Yeah, the guy because, gets a Kindle that's not exactly like other Kindles, and I won't yeah. spoil it from there. Shows you something. Yeah, gives yeah. you glimpses into something, which I won't go into. What he yeah, into. exactly. I mean, look at all the cool things these guys could have done. That's why I mentioned Ur. Uh, and to your point earlier, uh, Philip, about the audience the creators deliberately having the audience decide what happens uh, that done right. That works. Like f f for example, the thing, right. the end of the thing, you know, the audience, uh, the audience right. has been debating that for decades and that's great. That's great. But uh, that's not what these guys did. They did it horribly. Well, it reminds, you know, you were saying Philip that nobody would do that in, in, in early years. He actually did it on the uh, on the final episode of Patrick McGowan is the Prisoner, which if you're watching that as as a kid at least, I mean I can appreciate a little of the allegorical elements right. as an adult. But when I saw that, I was said, "What the heck just happened there?" Yeah, it's always well, a I, letdown when when they drag when they drag you through the muck and uh, and they they don't they you know when the creators when the creators don't have I mean. I don't know. It, it, it's, I guess to your point, Mike, it's hard to say because there are a lot of, and we were talking about this with Ellen a little bit. There's, there's a lot of storytelling. Storytelling has sort of changed or at least in my mind it has. And I think there's a lot more nowadays. It's kind of like, it's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. And I don't know if I believe that. I mean, I just don't know if I, don't know if I believe that, but if I did, the journey has to at least be enjoyable. Well, to Kelly, if Kelly Young were here, he would tell you that episode seven was the greatest hour of television ever made because Sissy's basic blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but he's he, he, exactly that because that's what he said to us. But I know he's very unhappy with the ending. Do we know, um, guys, what Stephen King, th like, has he said how he feels about it? He's not said a word about it. He might he not said, be able to. He, he, and he, said, well, he, he never said, does. No, he said that the money was great and he was having yeah. more millions than ever. <laughs> yeah. And he was happy yeah. and he was hoping there was going to be another five seasons with just the same money. He said, <laughs> he said hey, guys, the check the catch, check cleared. Uh, I think Stephen King probably felt about this one the same way he felt about the Dark Tower movie, which was he just doesn't say anything. Um, because I think when he likes something, he promotes it. Yeah, when he heavily. doesn't of his own – Coming from his own stuff, he says nothing. Yeah, he like he promotes um, he promotes the um, what you call it, uh, Mr. Mercedes series a lot. He's he I know he's a fan of that because he talks about it like once a week. He he pl plugs it. I haven't seen it, but it, um, right, Kelly has Kelly loves it. Yeah, he seems to plug it a lot, and that's I mean that could be reading into it. I don't know Stephen King, but it, 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 yeah, to you know he's the thing a with of a friend, which means a friend, I don't know him. he is a friend of a friend, oddly, but um. Of me, of me too, yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, 
I think it's a weird thing, and I'm and they're they're doing a season two, and and they and the one thing they did say in the interview that like we always saw this as being like American Horror Story, where each season will be its own contained story. And of course, my immediate response was, well, you have to have a story to be contained. But, um, but yeah, it just a, but it's even more disappointing that not only did they not finish telling this story, I thought they were going to kind of at least keep. I thought maybe this story was going to keep going, but I guess it's not. That's it. What we just saw, that's it. That's the beginning, middle, and end of whatever that was, and it's really disappointing. And 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 Henry putting the other Henry in jail again, in below the prison, just uh, it kind of it just sickened me. It was a terrible ending. And you don't know why the first Gordon killed himself. That was never really explained. Yeah. It you, was. Don't, you don't know why, and it was just, and there was just also this bad TV throughout. Like when this, the, where they really jumped the shark for me is when Henry broke into that the house, the 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 where the murder couple was living. When he broke, he was like, "There's something," and it was like the most stupid reason in the world. It was like, "There's something about this house I need to know." And he went, and he, then he's like breaking into people's homes and like digging through and their drawers. And stuff. Arrested. He never got arrested. That guy could have. He was like. He was at like six murder scenes. He broke into someone's house, and well, he did, maybe he they arrested maybe? him in the last episode. They did just, they? Yeah, that was. You know what? The, you know what? That brings up a good away. Point. In the last episode, he got arrested, and then it skips to one year later. Oh, right, and it right, Never right. explains why he was cleared. Well, they all all the policemen were killed, right? Yeah. So there well, was how does that sheriff go? was dead. There was no more police in the town, so they just let everybody out. Oh, Jesus. They probably, they probably had no record of him getting arrested after whatever happened in the last episode. Whatever happened Look, with all the carnage. I'll tell but you what. When it comes if, to leaps of, you know. If there is a season two, I won't be watching. No, I won't be watching season two either, unfortunately. And if there's a season two, why in the world would there be a season two? I don't know. They, they, they paid for it. I looked up, so um, a lot of what Philip said about the ending, you know, the writers were just like, oh, it's it's a smart ending. We want our viewers to think. So I went back, and I remember when Breaking Bad ended, and people were scared that Breaking Bad was going to end like Sopranos because that was the current trend. And Vince Gilligan, um, he actually said specifically that he would not give his fans an ending like that because it wasn't fair to them. You've invested all this time in this story, right. and then to cut them out and to just, oh, no, you don't. You don't need to know what really happened. You can. You can come make that up for yourself. He said there that needs to be a payoff for all right. the time spent. Well, yeah. What happens? What, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Benjamin. Go ahead. Well, so yeah, it's just so he said that. Well, that wasn't fair to his fans. And if you look back, Sopranos was considered the greatest TV series of all time. And then after that ending, no one talks about it. People felt disappointed. And when you're disappointed by the finale, you don't care about the rest of the show. True. Breaking Bad, people talk about Breaking Bad to this day. They, because you got you got what you asked for. You got a you may not have loved the, the what happened to the characters, but you got an ending to your story, to that investment in time. And I think with these writers, I think it's a trend. And with these writers, they have a history of it, unfortunately. And gosh, I mean it's they had as as Philip was saying, they had such great source material. And I thought that at the very end, they make a mention of William Jerzyk, and it's the first outright statement they make regarding needful things, and they don't even get the reference right. They reference her as though she was a different character. Both of these characters had died. It literally felt like someone just went to the Stephen King website, saw the list of characters for needful things, because that's an actual page on there, and just randomly selected a name. Hey, this is a girl. We're going to have, talk, you know, have them talk about Petunias. It felt like they had no actual concept maybe they read the stand or something but they didn't they i don't feel like they were familiar with the actual source material at all they saw the shining they read maybe one or two books and they used google for the rest of it it really felt like that especially in that finale yeah yeah i just think i see benjamin's point it feels like there's a little bit of a trend where writers are just trying to be it's like they're trying so hard to be smart and intellectual instead of just telling a good story and i mean i think the, the west world suffers from this pain and tell a story yeah west world suffers a lot from the look how smart we are syndrome um 
And but even even Westworld gave you a finale of some but, sort. But it works. Yeah. At least it worked. Yeah, it there was, it did make sense. You you had to kind of really dig. You had to work for it, but it did make sense. Lost is a lost is a, made no lost made no sense. Lost was like a thousand red herrings. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, let me throw in Kelly loves that show. Every time we mention Lost to him, he tells us how what idiots we are because we, we don't like the show. So yeah, that's another that well that shows. I mean, Lost was the big Lost was the big show where they everybody was up in arms because everyone wanted to know what everything meant. And you never find out what anything meant, and um, they didn't know. Right, they because they didn't know. You know, they said in interviews literally they said they didn't know that they didn't yeah. have a plan and nope. they were just sort of playing it by ear. Playing it. And it's so satisfying. Sorry, Rick, I'll go right back to you. It's so satisfying when you go back and you see see things, you see clues, and you're like, oh, that's what that meant. You know, all yeah. these little payoffs. It's so satisfying, and you don't get that with Lost. You don't get that with yeah. with uh, Castle Rock. Sorry, that's Rick. Screenwriting 101. Or always tw the return of Twin Peaks, which gave me a whole season with, nothing, with no major question from really the first see from the first run of the series was really answered. Yeah. See, but Twin Peaks to me was a show that was definitely about the journey. I didn't watch Twin Peaks because I wanted to know who killed what's her face. I watched Twin Peaks because it was such a beautiful show and so quirky and so weird. And so I, I gave it I gave it a bit of a pass. But finales are hard. I mean Seinfeld was a disaster. Yeah, Sopranos was a disaster, an epic disaster. Um, you know, these are shows that are like heralded as the greatest ever made, and uh, it's hard to land on your feet. It's a real, I mean, it's a real, it's a lot harder than people think, uh, and it's a lot harder to do in fiction than people think. Everyone thinks that if it has a good, a solid ending that wraps things up nicely, that it's like you almost made something easier than it is if it were just a kind of, you know leave you with a million questions and it's 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 harder to do than people realize to come up with a good story with a beginning middle and an ending that lands i agree that it i understand that it's hard but from that interview that you posted these writers literally thought well this is really hard i'm just not gonna bother yeah they just they yeah. didn't care they're like all right i'm just gonna let this go then and forget about it and we can just claim that oh well you have to come up with an ending yeah, You're putting that on If you were viewers. as smart as us, you would know what this meant. Oh, right. it was such an annoying interview to read too, because you could just you could sense their snobby smartness in the interview. They were like using a lot of big words, and I think they said the word. I think they used philosophy a couple times, and they just sound like a couple of Harvard grads who don't who never read a Stephen King book in their lives. And I I even posted in that same comment where you linked it. I I said they were going to say that hours before you posted that link. It was. You could see as soon as I watched that ending, I knew that you were a hundred percent right back when we talked about this after episode seven. And it was like, nope, yeah, they had no idea. They just got a big property and they wanted to cash some checks. Yeah, like, uh, to me or Philip when the Philip. right thing. I guess both of you really. Damn it it oh, would have been it would have been nice to see what if it was it would have been nice to have seen what somebody who was really invested in Stephen King would have done with that series. I mean, maybe yeah. wouldn't have had the you know obtuse beauty of episode seven and Sissy's basic looking around for chess pieces, but it probably would have been a lot more satisfying. They even said with that episode that, is there any functional difference between her actually drifting through time or, uh, you know, uh, having, uh, sorry, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's having what you call yes, it. There's a functional difference because you can change things if you're actually yeah. drifting through time. Well, and yeah. they're looking at it, as directors, if you're directing the episode, there might not be a functional difference. If you're anyone that cares about what's happening in the story at all, then yes, it's that's the stupidest comment. I I can't. It's I'm insulted when writers or, you know, in this case, directors. It just that stuff like that tells me that they don't actually care. You see this, Mike. You're a big Batman fan. How many times can you count that a Batman writer? does something crazy or stupid like that. And their reasoning is, oh, well, I'm just telling my story. And this mm -hmm. is my story. And and you have to figure out for yourself what this means. Or like they did it with Batman's recent um, failed marriage thing with the Catwoman. Oh, well, we're telling the story that no one's ever told before. And it's like, you know, Batman's been around for more than 75 years. You know how many failed marriage attempts he's had yeah. for 75 years? 
right? I was reading a Brave and the Bold issue from the 50s where this exact same thing happened. But they don't actually read all that stuff. They don't, they don't actually care. They're just putting out whatever the latest piece is, and then they want to sound smart. Yeah, and they want to cash the paycheck. Well, let's hope that the Dark Tower television series, when it, and if it ever comes to fruition, will be more satisfying for Stephen King fans. I want a Doom McKee television series. That's what I want. Uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic book. That's one of my favorites of his. It's very underrated. Stephen very King underrated. Book. Yep. It's probably the tenth time I've mentioned it on this show. Yeah, you and me, you and me both are on the same page with that one. I love that book. I matter of fact, it deserves a re. I need to reread it. I haven't read it in about ten years or whenever it came out. So God, it's it's just so great, and it would just be, it would be brilliant as a limited edition series. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anyway, uh, we'll end up with someone on the message board wrote, "I'll never forgive Jar Jar Abrams." So. <laughs> That's that's a great point to end on. Uh, next week we've got Tim Wagoner, uh, and then the week after that Brian Hodge. As long as he can make it, otherwise we'll make it one of those shows where we yak about anything and everything, like we just did. I'm reading so, Tim Wagoner's novel. I'm what? reading Tim Wagoner's novel right now. It's so far very good. It's Which flame, one? His new one from Flame Tree Press, the mouth in the uh, the mouth of the dark. I think it's called. Yes, and he also writes a supernatural. He's written several supernatural um, novels. There's a lot of tie-ins, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and he's a and he's a teacher. He teaches creative writing. The Mouth of the Dark is the name of the book by it's Flame Tree Press. Yeah. So Tim Wagoner next week, and um, everyone, thanks for listening. Uh, if thank you to all the patrons who keep me going, really, truly, uh, I don't make a lot of money. Uh, barely anything for all of this. My wife's a teacher, and you guys really keep me going. So uh, if uh, I'm going to post that uh, Knife Point Horror podcast interview tomorrow sometime, and uh, it's only five dollars a month. If you're not a patron, you know, get on there and you can listen to that one and um, all the previous ones. Just Google Lovecraft Easing Patreon. And thanks to you guys for being here. Appreciate it. Thanks so, for having us. Yeah. So, thanks, guys. And it's Heather. What's the name of that comic again? Oh, um, the Killing of Dreams. Killing of Dreams. I gotta, I gotta buy that after I end the show. So, <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody, and we will see you next week.